Welcome, everybody. Hello. Did everyone have a good lunch? Good, good. Okay, uh, so it's been a fantastic symposium so far. We're in the final stretch now. I know uh, we're already, you know, um, just after lunch. Thankfully, we have a very entertaining uh, first speaker in this session. Um, Nick uh, has joined us uh, as a last minute change. Uh, he'd be talking about the future of uh, custom experience. So what's happening today, um, you know, the customers, our audiences, don't think about multi-channel and they don't think about omni-channel, right? They don't look at engagement uh, through those lenses. Their behavior is that they just simply seamlessly move between touch points and they expect us to follow them. And if we don't, then they get frustrated. And we forget about that because our thinking still is too siloed. So what happens is, as omnichannel becomes so seamless, it becomes almost invisible. And what Nick will talk about is the idea of the channelless customer, or the channelless experience. Now, after that, um, we'll be looking at, so if that's the, you know, the future of uh, customer experience, what's the near future? So, you know, transformation is, is, a, is a journey, it's not a destination. Um, so what's happening right now is, you know, if you focus, if you keep your focus on what customers actually need, uh, you'll, be, you'll be aware of, of, the, of the rise of, of voice and chat and the idea of conversational engagement, conversational commerce. So the, the second speakers, uh, Dave and Marcus, they're going to be looking at uh, some real examples uh, of what they're doing with, for the uh, Australian tourism industry and how they're able to use uh, chat as a way to uh, meaningfully engage key audiences that come from China uh, and gives you some uh, insights uh, and ideas of how to... Um, to use chat yourselves. Uh, but first of all, uh, please welcome Nick Kontopoulos, um, who uh, from Agento, who will be talking about the future of uh, customer experience. A warm welcome, please, for Nick. Cheers. Thank you, Merrick. Entertaining. I was thinking you're going to say I'm going to sing and dance, but that's not happening, OK? So I'm deeply passionate about the topic I'm going to talk to you about today. So I want you to buckle up, get ready for a ride. The next 30 minutes, I've got a captive audience. And we're going to talk about what the future customer experience looks like. And as Merrick said, I'm going to argue that we need to think about uh, that future through a channelist lens. So my objective will be to throw some mind grenades at you, get your brain juices fired up, and hopefully you'll take away one or two ideas from this talk that you can start thinking about in your own organizations. That will be success for me. But I want you to also start this journey with me as a consumer. I want you to think about what I'm talking about as consumers. Put your business personas behind you, beside you. Don't completely lock them away, because I still want you to think through, through that lens. But think about what we're going to talk about now, or I'm going to talk about now, as a consumer. And I'm going to start this with my own journey as a consumer. I was born in 1971. I know I don't look it, but yes, 1971, April 23rd, for any of those who want to keep track and send me gifts. And when I think about my journey as a consumer, really a lot of those decisions early on were made by my mum and my dad. You know, they really, their focus was really around you know, my physical security, safety. Yeah? But as I got a little bit older, you know, I started wanting things. And the very first product I really wanted was Masters of the Universe. He-Man, the He-Man doll. Do you remember that? Those that are old enough in the audience might remember who that is. Those that are younger are like, who the hell is He-Man? Well, He-Man was that item that I wanted. And I desperately wanted him. So that was my first consumer purchase. But as I got older, as I moved into the 80s, um, my decisions started to, to evolve. And, and how I made my decisions were influenced you know, the next phase was all about Kiss and Gene Simmons. I had the dolls, I had the face paint. If you look at the photos of when I'm younger, my tongue's always sticking out. So that was my next generation. I had this sense of, well, next sort of uh, evolution of my consumer journey. And it was really about belonging. I really wanted to be belong, belong. And again, as I got older, you know, moved into my teens and early 20s, you know, again, my peer groups started to play a big role 
in influencing my decisions. I move in the 90s, now I'm making money. Now I've got spending power, I've got, you know, I can make a lot of my own decisions and I don't have to ask my mum and dad for permission to buy. So this is the age of, you know, becoming a yuppie, you know. I wanted to be Don Johnson, so I had people like Don Johnson influencing my style. I look pretty dapper there, don't I? You know, I started to become more aware of brands and you know, I started to buy goods as a result of my you know, aspirational desire to have those, those items to, to make me feel most really accepted, you know. Then I move into the 2000s and this is where I met my lovely wife and I have my kids and my priorities fundamentally change and move away from me and more to them. So that's sort of been my journey as, in a, as, a, uh, as a consumer. And I think, you know, I've also been very passionate and interested in people and what makes us tick. And I guess that's what drew me to sales and marketing um, and business development roles. And when I was at business school, I remember one uh, concept, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, really struck a chord with me. Um, you know, I've had the great pleasure of traveling 65 old countries now. And when I looked at this uh, concept, I saw that actually there's a lot more that unites us and divides us. And I th when we think about how we make our decisions, I think this pyramid you know, is a great reflection of how we go through that journey. And we start with the physical needs, and as we grow as individuals, we move up that pyramid to where now, if we think about that last step, we start to see a maturity in how we make decisions is very much influenced by experiences and, and, and desires that we have. But if we also map that pyramid to how customers evolved and sort of how consumers evolved, we started off in the first uh, uh, block. You know, we look at the pre-industrial age. It was practical staples like food and medicine. These are the products and services that we were looking for. As we move up, the industrial age, you know, things like insurance and banking became important. Then we move into the 80s. We see branding become a more important uh, topic. We see people be taking more interest in credit cards and products and how they make them feel. And when we get to the last stage, I think we now see a stage where it's all about fulfillment and enrichment, you know, and things like customer experiences become incredibly important. So when we think about that journey, and then we look at our own journey as marketers, you know, again, I think it's great to have a quick look at history and where we've come from and see how those, uh, that journey's been influenced. And in particular, if we look at it in terms of the role of technology. So if we go back to the 70s, what we see here is really where technology um, really starts to play a role in influencing us as consumers. It's really, the, the, I think, the, the age of the digital revolution. You know, we start to see technology influencing marketers and how they position and ultimately look at us as consumers. As we move into the 80s, we start to see technology again evolving, opening up new possibilities. This is where the VCR becomes a, a new technology for us to, to view content and ultimately has an impact on how my, um, you know, brands advertise to us because we could use a VCR machine to record a show and quickly accelerate through the ads. We saw you know, the mobile phone you know, start to, to, to begin uh, to make an impact on us as consumers. We move in the 90s. Again, technology is picking up. The rapid change of technology is picking up. We start to see you know, consumers getting more control over how they have a conversation with us as a brand. Mass media, e-commerce becomes uh, established as a, as a concept. I remember 1997, I was in London and I bought my first CD through an e-commerce site and had it delivered to me in an hour. So again, some of these ideas aren't new. It's just that the technology wasn't really there yet to deliver on a lot of the promises that would be made. We moved to the 2000s and again, now we see pace picking up, technologies coming you know, evolving rapidly. We're seeing, you know, Facebook launches. We see the iPhone, which I think is quite a pivotal moment. 2007 for me was quite a pivotal moment because not only did the iPhone get launched, but Steve Jobs, time, Jobs timed that perfectly with Wi-Fi and 3G. These three different technologies came together and it opened up a whole new world of possibilities for us as consumers. And if we look at this last 10 years, or well, last eight years, again, what we now see is a globally connected audience we see that trust and transparency is becoming increasingly important. So as we share data with brands, where our expectations of what they do and how they use that, 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 uh, that data is increasing. So then if we think about this through the lens of um, you know, multi-channel marketing and how we've connected, how we connect with our audiences, if we start back in the industrial age, again, it was very simple. Things were a lot easier, you know? 
We had horses that would carry a message from one place to the other, or we had the telephone or TV. It was very simple. The channels weren't that, weren't too many channels. We move into the sort of the you know the digital revolution and the information age. We see the channels open up, opening up more possibilities for us as marketers、um, to engage that audience. And over the last five years, we've seen a lot of talk about omni-channel, and again, increasingly important strategy to have in your organisation. But what I'm going to challenge here is omni-channel is often an inside-out, technology-led conversation, which I think we need to start thinking about、um, a, a new concept or a new idea of thinking about the channel as customer. Because at the end of the day, we as customers don't think in terms of any type of channel. That's the argument I'm going to put forward today. And the reality is, as we've seen, this transfer of power from from the brands to the consumers again. Not telling you guys anything new here, but again, I think it's really important that we recognise that technology is playing a huge role in changing the behaviours of how we、uh, interact with brands as consumers. Brian Solis, I think, says it really well here. You know, again, a great thinker. If you're not familiar with him, I, I highly recommend you, you you follow him. But the reality is, we have huge expectations now on brands, and and we don't really care about. How hard it is for us to, to make and deliver great customer experiences to them. As a consumer, I expect you as a brand to connect with me both in the physical and digital worlds. I don't really care how hard it is for you to do that, because the reality is, is I've got a huge amount of choice, both locally, regionally, and globally to choose from. And the fact is, as I said earlier, the, the customer journey used to be very a lot, lot easier. When I first started working in 1990. You know, as a salesperson, I controlled a lot of the the, the the conversation. I had a lot of the information that the the the, the buyers were looking for. They they were almost forced into dealing with me. But now, you, right this very second, you guys could be looking at my profile on LinkedIn, thinking, "Who's this turkey? Why should I be listening to this guy? What what what, what credibility does he have in this space?" You can be doing this right now. The reality is, there's so many channels for us, and that information just waiting to be unlocked. And the fact is. We're being chased all the time. We're chasing our customers all over the place. But guess what? Those customers are getting smart. They're actually smarter than us. They know that they can game the system. They know they can go on an e-commerce website, load up the shopping basket, and then abandon it. And know within 24, 48 hours they're going to get an offer of saying, "We'll give you 10% off that if you come back and buy from us." So they're very sophisticated. And the reality is, we're now living in an age of digital Darwinism, where technology. And society is evolving faster than our businesses. That's a reality. Most of the、um, business models that drive our businesses today were invented in the 20th century. The sales and marketing funnel was invented in 1898, a 19th century business model. So the reality is, our businesses are still operating in a completely different era. Yet you and I, as consumers, aren't. We're we're operating in the now, in the future. So we can, you know, some people say, "Well, let's hope and pray this goes away, the problem goes away." Some of us start looking at retrofitting legacy technologies in the hope that we can try to reconfigure it in a way that hopefully meets today's needs of、uh, the customers of today, to customers today's needs.、Um, but the reality is a lot of complexity there. Yeah, these systems were designed and depend on personalization rules that were ultimately designed for single touch points. They weren't designed. As part of an end-to-end customer journey, and this is a real challenge. They ultimately are reactive, and this is the the, the challenge I see glo- globally with a lot of brands is that they're on the back foot in this respect. And the fact is, we're going to see this problem not go away. In actual fact, change is changing itself. The rate of change is increasing exponentially. So we need to accept that. As individuals in this room, we need to be comfortable with that, and we need to then start thinking about how, as I, as an individual, can start to adapt to this new reality. How can I start working with other parts of the organisation to adapt to this new reality? Because again, the research shows that we have to do this. You know, research involving seven EU telco markets found that consumers, when they embarked on a journey that involved multiple channels, saw their experiences,、uh, you know, negatively impacted. And here's the, here's the rub: we don't care about single touch points. What we care about is making you making that experience effortless for me, removing 
that unnecessary friction in the relationship. That's what's really important to us. They care about experiences, and they don't care about channels. Sorry about the formatting issue there. It's obviously crept in between the uh, our test yesterday. So what we do is we look at these channels as windows, as opportunities that we, we see them as a window into your brand. We don't see them uh, in, in any other way. So where does the challenge lie? Well, it lies in our organization. It lies in our culture of our organization. This is a key area that I want you guys to think about because technology will not succeed unless you understand this point. You need to build and work in creating a culture that knocks these silos down because all silos do is create uh, you know, bubbles, insular cultures and behaviors and processes that ultimately flourish inside these, these silos but don't see the full potential being unlocked. So we need to look at how we can transform these silos, you know, look at moving away, you know, moving away from this model where we have guardians of these silos to one where we really see our organization working collectively together. Ultimately, we have to do that. If we do not do that, it doesn't matter how much money you spend on technology, you will not succeed. The reality is a lot of our organizations have been built around transactions and not journeys. Again, I think only two or three percent, if uh, Gartner, I think, remember a stat from Gartner saying two to three percent of businesses have a complete blueprint of their customers' journeys end to end in their organization. They're ultimately wired to maximize productivity. Again, often the customer's lost in all that noise. The reality is we need to think about our customers in terms of an end to end journey. And the reality, again, the reality there is that if we do this, we see the benefits flow through to businesses in terms of you know, repeat spends and you know, people recommending their brands. Because touch points, if we view it through touch points, ultimately they're very transient. Journeys are holistic. They consider the customer's journey, and if we consider the customer's journey end to end, we've got a higher chance of that customer having the experience that we hope to deliver them. And ultimately to do this, we need to think of it in a channelist lens. Because who here goes into a buying experience thinking about, I'm in the retail channel now, I'm in the mobile channel, I'm in the chat channel. We don't think about it in that lens. So we need to think about how do we bring this all together. So, a lot of a change ahead of us, but there's also a huge opportunity for us to embrace here. And the opportunity is significant. If we look at e-commerce growth globally, we're seeing a 20% year-on-year growth in terms of or compound annual growth rate of people spending online and moving their spending online. If we look at that through the lens of Asia, it's even higher, 32%. More and more of, uh, if you're selling into Asia now, you need to be thinking about how you're organizing your business in terms of being able to transact business with them through e-commerce platforms, be it through a laptop or mobile device. The fact is our region as a whole is leading the way in this respect. It's a huge opportunity, huge potential for all of us, both at an individual level in terms of individual professionals, as business units, as divisions, as ultimately as a, a, as a brand in itself. So it's really exciting. We should embrace this. We should look at the opportunities that are there for us, waiting for us to grab, reach out and grab it. We should look at how we can start generating that excitement inside of our organization, finding people that share a common passion. Because the great brands that do this and individuals that do this will ultimately be the ones that succeed, the ones that will evolve, that will move at the pace their customers expect them to move at. Ultimately, we need to think about, and I'm not saying omnichannel isn't something we shouldn't be thinking about, but I just want to caution that as a, when I look at a lot of the brands I've worked with over the recent years is they have a very t inside out view of that, and it tends to look at this in terms of very, through a very technology-led uh, lens. We need to think about this in terms of people, process, and technology. The great thing about Omnichannel was looking at how we can start bringing our organizations together around that and looking at how we can use data to better contextualize the experiences we're, we're delivering. And context actually was a big focus point for that. What I suggest going forward will be is that you know, as we look to bring the front and back end uh, channels, uh, organization, sorry, front and back end uh, processes together and organize ourselves around the businesses, we need to double down on making sure that that 
the, the channels become invisible. That ultimately, convergence is going to be a key focus point here. How do we converge these channels into a seamless, beautiful customer experience? That's the next challenge. How do we do that? How do we do that at scale across all parts of our organization? Marketing, sales, logistics, supply chain, all of these pieces, our ecosystem that we work with, that is where the brands that are at the forefront of this, uh, this topic are now invest investing. So the goal here is to look at driving a transformation in our organization that is ultimately seamless, ultimately channelless. If I look at you know, uh, Alibaba and uh, Jack Ma, he gets this. And in China, he's delivering this. This is exactly where he's moving his brand. If I look at brands in Asia now, they're investing heavily in this type of strategy. So it starts with the customer, not the channel. So we need to start thinking about that. We need to look to work with our other uh, colleagues across the organization. We need to start looking at how do we build this data cloud around the individual customer. We need to look at how do we close the loop between offline and online. And to do that, we need to start working, as I said, with our other colleagues in different departments. Build a tribe of people that share a common passion, common desire. They're there. Find them. Unlock that. Bring them together. Start having conversations with them around how we can drive this change across your organization. Again, sounds obvious. Talk to your customers. Have them co-create in the process. Bring them into that conversation. Don't begin redesigning your customer experience without having them involved in that process. A great example of an Australian brand that's doing this was on the stage yesterday. Mark Tepperson uh, is a CDO there. I'm going to play a video from, from him and, and the Ascent Group, which because I believe this is a great local example of a brand that gets this from the executive leadership down. So I'll play the video now. <laughs> The Accent Group is a regional leader in footwear retail and distribution. Ten different retail brands, Hype, Platypus, Vans, Timberland, Merrill, Sketches, and the athlete's foot. When it came to executing our digital vision and trying to bring that to life with the same conviction and authenticity that we'd been able to execute our physical retail, that presented a real big challenge. Deciding to go from M1 to M2 was a really important decision for us. Axon had a real challenge because of the number of brands um, that they needed to bring onto one umbrella and one of the things that they understood very early on is um, that the industry is moving from products and commodities into services and experiences. E-Wave bring a really unique perspective on how to dial up a digital experience for a consumer. One of the biggest appeals about Magento is its open source platform. It means that when we reimagine those experiences that we can bring them to life because we're not constrained. We have more than 400 stores across the country. We were thinking of them in a very traditional format. We were thinking of them as stores. If we started thinking of them as distribution centers, how could that transform the way that we delivered experiences to customers. Click and Collect really started to gain momentum. The connection between our digital assets and our physical assets really got closer and closer together. And then we thought to ourselves, well, why can't we make this inventory available to all customers when they shop online? And so we developed Click and Dispatch, or Ship from Store. We saw an immediate lift overnight. We doubled our conversion rate. Magenta 2 was really built to compete with um, the best level enterprise platforms in the world and that's really what it's doing. One of the best success stories that we've had with Magento has been replatforming our platypus business where we took it from a really old infrastructure straight into M2 and in the first 12 months from replatforming we've been able to grow sales by more than 10 times the original first year numbers. No limits with Magenta 2 so we have a very aggressive rollout plan um, for 2018 and 19. In transforming how we retail our business over the last 12 months has given us a lot of confidence around what the future looks like. 
Three months ago, we made a decision to set up a digital hub down here in Melbourne and create a centre of excellence for the whole organisation. We said to ourselves, how do we power Endless Isle? How do we make that inventory available to all of our stores? so that they can use that as a sales opportunity to make sure that we over deliver on that customer expectation every time. And we now have a vision in front of us for three hour delivery, where a consumer in any of our stores through any of our channels can get product delivered to their door within three hours anywhere across the country. Digital is no longer a threat to our retail business. Digital is a really important pillar of strength for our retail business. You're not constrained in terms of what you can deliver in the digital context. And reimagining that experience for consumers is what makes it really exciting. Fantastic example of a brand that's reimagining the way it could take a traditional bricks and mortar store and, and go head to head with those pure digital players in the market. So again, fantastic example of an experienced maker. I've got another great story here as well of a brand that is also driving, uh, you know, taking a, an old world brand and actually transforming its business. And this one comes out of Japan. This is uh, uh, Aoki, is a classical. Uh, traditional retail outlet store where a lot of people will go and buy their first suits uh, when they go and work. So very traditional in how it operated. Uh, it realized last year that it needed to change its business model. In actual fact, it's created a subscription-based model where I can now subscribe on a monthly basis and go online and actually order my suits and have them shipped to me. I can have them tailored to my fittings. I can have them uh, delivered to me um, uh, you know, at a time that suits me, etc. And I can keep that suit for as long as I want. Not just a suit, also the shirts, the ties, etc. So a whole outfit can be shipped to me. Again, a great example of a brand that is reimagining how it can engage its, its uh, fast evolving consumer base. So those two brands I wanted to share with you as great examples of companies that are really at the forefront and have come from a traditional business model. So we are seeing success in this space. Um, I'm in the backstretch now of the presentation. So what I want you to also think about is that loyalty is now very fleeting. Again, uh, the reality is, as we all know, keeping a customer is, is, a, is a lot harder than it used to be. So we need to really understand what drives them. We need to be able to make it easy for them to do business with us. We need to know what we know about the customer, bring that together, that information, and actually engage on their terms. We need to do this because if we can do this and we can start understanding how they behave within our ecosystem, we can start to anticipate what they are expecting from us before hopefully um, they do. So with that, Magento, who was recently acquired by Adobe, and I'm super excited about this when you think about what we can now do together as a collective uh, brand is, is able to work with you in helping drive a transformation in your e-commerce uh, stores if you have them already set up or if it's an area that you're looking to invest in. We can work with you in helping build out that channelist experience. But when you overlay that now with the Adobe capabilities, we really have what I believe is a world-class solution. I'm super excited about this story that we are unable to tell together. Um, again, if you'd like to learn more about that, please come over to the booth. We've got a great looking bunch of people there ready to have a chat to you. Um, so feel free to do that. But I want to close on this quote. Uh, this quote, I think, is a really great quote. It's from a, a thinker um, who was well ahead of his times. And you know, he was famously quoted saying, because the purpose of business is to create a customer, the business enterprise has two and only two basic functions, marketing and innovation. Marketing and innovation produce results. All the rest are costs. Now, as a marketer, I love that. That's awesome. You know, it's, and I'm sure most of you are like, yeah, that's really cool. We do play an important role. But the reality is, if I think if he was here today, he'd update that. And he would say customer experience and innovation are the two most important things, with CX representing the entire enterprise. But as marketers, I see it as our job is to go out and create that um, excitement, that buzz, to be the chief orchestrators and architects of what that customer experience looks like. So I think marketing plays an incredible important role in helping drive this. At the end of the day, we need to make it ex you know, exciting to do business with our brands. We need to take the fear out of, uh, you know, remove the friction from what it, that exists in our business and, and, and take away the fear that a customer might be having when they ring our call center. We want to engage them on their terms. We need to adapt to their, the way they're evolving as consumers. 
we need to, to operate through the channels they're operating, but also remember that those have to be seamless in how we engage them. We need to individualize. I actually would argue we've got to move from personalization actually to individualization. How do we really connect with those individuals at a, at a deep individual level? The fact is, again, um, I stole this slide from Mark Tepperson. He had this in his deck, uh, one of the presentations I saw, and I thought it was brilliant. Because, again, the research is showing that if you can bring the physical and digital experiences together in a harmonized way, you can create an amazing uh, engagement experience for that customer, and ultimately that flows through in terms of your ability to deliver both top-line and bottom-line benefits to your organization. So transformation is a journey, not a destination. Remember that. You know, at the end of the day, it all starts with our customers and understanding their journeys and what they, how those journeys unfold end to end. We need to ultimately engage these customers and show that we love them. But a lot of what I've said today is focused on the customers, but we've also got to remember our employees in this equation as well. How do we help empower them to deliver on the brand promises we're making? Again, this needs to be very much front and center in terms of the, our, 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 when we're designing our, um, our customer experiences, we need to think about the employee experience as well, all through that journey. I'm going to throw down a challenge to each and every one of you as well here today. Go back into your organizations. Start disrupting. Start finding the guy in supply chain that shares a similar passion, the guy that, or one of your, your colleagues that's in finance that has a similar passion. Start bringing those people together. Start having, creating conversations around how you can drive this transformational change in your organization. Really, I think, we, and as business leaders, we need to empower our employees to do this. So with that, I want to thank you for coming and hearing me talk today. My name is Nicholas Contopoulos. I'm on LinkedIn. If you want to connect with me, feel free to do so. Again, we'll be over the Magento booth. Feel free to come over and, and, and learn more about what we have to do. Thank you very much for your time today. Take care. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. That was a fascinating presentation. Uh, very enjoyable as well. We're going to change gears a little bit now, and we're going to talk about both a problem uh, and an opportunity that exists for a particular industry segment. And my clicker is starting to work fantastic. We're going to talk about the Australian tourism industry. So you might have seen in the initial keynotes, John O'Sullivan, the MD, talked about a problem that Tourism Australia was trying to solve in a particular market. That market was the US market. And I guess we've been talking um, with a couple of different organisations within the Australian tourism industry about how we might solve another problem, and that problem being how we can humanise a little bit more the brand Australia message to the Chinese traveller. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then Marcus is going to join, and he's going to talk about the solution that we're putting forward there. So let me give you a snapshot. I actually used to work at Tourism Australia as well in what seems to be another life a long time ago, and these were the numbers that we would look at all the time. We'd look at the visitor numbers, how many people are coming. We'd look at the overnight spend, what does that look like? Um, and then we'd also look at the nights that they'd stay as well. The reason the tourism industry is important to Australia is because it's, it's a major employer in Australia as well. Almost a million people employed by the tourism industry. It accounts for about 8% of the total employment um, at this time. So it's an important industry. If we look at how that's broken down in terms of the I international travellers that come to Australia, it's dominated really at the moment by one segment um, in terms of overnight spend. And it's probably no surprise in, in terms of vicinity, in terms of friendship and trade and all of those other things. That's the Chinese outbound tourist. That's the leisure and business tour uh, tourist from China who's coming to Australia, um, spending a lot of money, spending almost three times more money um, than the next closest market um, of, of visitors that arrive in Australia. And so we've looked at this and we've said, well, is there an opportunity here? Is there an opportunity to do something about um, making that even better or making the experience even more uh, seamless and enjoyable than it is now? And I guess what, where we've got to start then is we've got to start with China and the, the Chinese consumer, and we've got to look at how does the Chinese consumer go about their daily lives? Well, there's one dominant platform in China, and, uh, uh, or one dominant, sorry, trend in China, and that's that Chinese um, love their smartphone and are very much mobile first. Um, over 80% of Chinese smartphone users also use one application. A billion users use this application every day, and that's WeChat. And so what is WeChat? WeChat is a little bit 
more than just a chat pl platform. It's a platform that is almost like an ecosystem, an operating system for the mobile phone where there's all sorts of utility. There's all sorts of functions and features that exist and can be tapped into. And I guess WeChat themselves and the Tencent organization are moving forward and innovating at a pace which is not being seen really on other platforms. They're leading the way. More than one third of a person's time now on a mobile phone is spent in WeChat in China. So we looked at that and we said, well, you know, if, if, if that's where the consumer is, what can we do there? How can we take these 3.5 million official accounts that brands are, are using to communicate their message? Um, how can we tap into those 1 billion users and growing? And so we thought about it for a while and we thought, well, there's two ways that brands interact on WeChat. First way is for official, inofficial accounts. And if any of you are selling anything in China right now, there's no doubt you've got an official account set up, either a service account or a subscription account. Um, it, I'd be very surprised if you didn't have at least that set up. And these are the two ways that you can interact. One is that official account. Think of that as a little bit like a, a web landing page, if you, if you like. And then the other way is with a new um, function and feature that's been rolled out by WeChat called mini programs. So think of mini programs as an app within an app. So definitely WeChat wanted to solve this problem of the consumer staying within their platform, not getting out of their platform, not leaving and going and downloading another app from the App Store or one of the many Android stores that, that exist in China. They want to keep the customer within WeChat for the longest possible time that they can. And so these mini programs have been created and already there's over 60 million of these um, that have been developed and that people are using every day. And they provide real utility to the user experience. So how can we pull all of this information together? And, and what do we know um, is a cause of friction for a Chinese tourist? Well, put yourself in um, their shoes. This is, this is my experience in my first time when I um, go to uh, China, or Shanghai in particular, maybe I'm staying there. I look at people using mobile payments like it's just natural. Uh, nobody's carrying cash. Uh, people are, um, put, put, I've got signs that I'm trying to follow that are not in my language, and my translation tools aren't working really well, and my Mandarin is terrible. So my whole experience is just full of friction. How do I get around? How, there's no Uber there. There's Didi. Well, think about it for a Chinese traveler. It's not any different. In fact, when they come to Australia, most tour operators don't even offer mobile payments. It's not something that's natural to offer Alipay or WeChat Pay payments. Yet the research shows from numerous, numerous um, reports that Chinese people will spend more money in destination if they can pay using the methods that they know and prefer and love. There's a whole lot of reasons for this, but it's a real truth that we thought we could tap into as well. And so we took our idea to some different areas of the tourism and travel industry about how we could capture those Chinese travellers. And I guess what we want to do here is we want to look at that brand Australia. We looked at the friction and we looked at the behaviour of the consumer and we said, well, how, how do we humanise? What can we do? Surely conversations are the most natural ways for humans to interact. Surely um, a digital-first consumer wants to interact digitally as well. So how can we do that? Well, I guess we looked at this consumer truth. Chinese travellers continue to use WeChat abroad as their primary digital tool, and they look for something that can help them throughout their trip. So if you've ever accompanied a Chinese traveller in Australia, um, recently, in fact, um, you will see that they're constantly connected. Their mobile phone plans, their, their, their um, roam, global roaming plans are more competitive than we can buy here in Australia right now. My business partners here this week um, were doing some things and he was telling me that for unlimited data this week it was costing him $10, um, which is quite amazing when you think about it. Not for a day, not for a 500 meg download, for the whole week that's what it's costing. So he's constantly connected um, while he's here. And what's he, what's he wanting to do? He's wanting to use his tools. He's wanting to use the things that he's comfortable with so that he can get the information that he needs um, because, of course, that's, that's his experience. That's what he expects now. He's a global citizen. Why shouldn't my things work um, the same way in another country as they work for me in China? So if we add that up and we say, well, well what's the market truth? 
Is the current experience great? Is the current experience fantastic for a Chinese traveller? One of the things that the tourism industry always talks about is being China-ready. I'm not quite sure what that means. For some, it means a congee breakfast um, in the hotel. For others, it means somebody who can speak Mandarin behind the, the service and sales desk. But this whole idea about making the consumer um, experience, while they're experiencing a different travel and tourism product in Australia, is what it's all about. And so how can we combine the consumer truth with the market truth and create that ex and, and meet that experience needs, sorry. So a one-stop shop for all their needs during their trip, a, compan a companion, if you like, a, an assistant to help their travel journey. Within the WeChat ecosystem, the dominant ecosystem and platform that they're used to using as well. So if we look at this WeChat companion, what does it look like? Well, it has activities that are being recommended. It has the opportunity to book product as well, all in language. There's the ability to look at the restaurants, to see the recommendations and to read what other people, travellers before them, have said. There's transportation guidance. There's an ability to tap into travel blogs. For those of you that don't know, travel blogging is such a big thing um, in China. And, and you know, Chinese travellers look to other people's experience um, to, to also plan their own next experience. And then, of course, this conversational piece, this humanising piece, of natural language processing with powered by AI. So that the, the, the tool can learn, the tool can understand the behaviours and put in place recommendations you know, before um, the, the consumers even asked for them and really tailor that experience um, the way that the consumer's expecting. And then of course there's other things as well like checking flight status and translation um, you know, tapping into some of the great work that's being done both by Chinese providers and also providers uh, like Google as well. Um, you know, weather checking, currency, and then, of course, local assistance as well. So what happens if we get in trouble and we need um, to, to call somebody? So these are the things that we are going to put into this mini-program that we're in the process of, of, of building um, to create this WeChat travel companion. And that way, through the whole trip, that this Chinese traveller has, from the time they arrive and they open that mini program and can see how they can get to where they need to go, maybe scanning a QR code, uh, maybe looking for a travel guide, right through to departure, they've got this travel companion in the tool that they're used to using, that they know how to use and that they're comfortable with using as well. But how are we going to get there? There's a few challenges. There's people who have tried to do pieces, bits and pieces of this before. So, so how are we going to get there? Well, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to create an engaging, chat-based customer experience. And we've got to make sure that that's powered by artificial intelligence so that it gets better over time, so that it adapts to the needs and, the per and provides a personalised experience over time. How do we handle edge cases where AI isn't trained? This is a big problem. What happens when that assistant just, and you've all had that experience, just can't answer your question, just can't give you, um, doesn't understand what you're talking about? How will we deal with that? Because we don't want to be, we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to embarrass the brand. How do we leverage Adobe Experience Cloud in WeChat, which so many different players in the Australian industry have already invested in, as you heard from um, uh, John O'Sullivan uh, yesterday morning? And then, of course, the last one, and the one we can't ignore, is how do we handle the increasingly complex security requirements? Think GDPR, that really scary word. So in order to answer these, we've engaged Marcus, and we're working with his team, and I'll let Marcus take it from here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Marcus Robinson. I'm the CEO of StackChat. I actually worked at Adobe for many years before leaving to found StackChat. And just a note on terminology, I'm going to speak to you a bit about chatbots, chat apps, intelligent assistants, voice assistants. These all refer to the same thing. And I'm going to talk a bit about chat and voice. And when I talk about chat, I'm referring to the text, the medium of text. When I talk about voice, obviously, speaking. So at StackChat, we believe that AI-driven voice and chat experiences are the next major disruption in computing. A voice or chat interface is a way to truly humanize your brand, because for the first time ever, your consumers aren't forced to think in unfamiliar business terms. They just say what they want, and then you as a brand respond immediately. 
We're moving towards a zero learning curve. A great example of this, Capital One, a US bank, they launched their Alexa skill recently. They built all the expected features, transferring money, opening accounts. But what did 70% of Capital One's customers ask for, which they totally didn't expect? How am I doing? How am I doing? Now, this was completely unexpected. It's human. It's colloquial. It means something totally different for different persons. For me, it might mean my credit card statements. For another person, it might mean their mortgage. So the Capital One team now are actually looking at building out a how am I doing feature, right? This is what consumers want. They want to be able to engage with their brands in this human way. Touch is losing ground as our primary user interface. Voice search has 20% share on mobile. By 2020, that'll hit 50%. By 2021, enterprises will spend more on intelligent assistance than traditional mobile app development. We're entering the age of immediate engagement. This doesn't mean that other channels are going away, but it just means consumers will just intuitively know the best channel for the function they're trying to do. So they want to do this, great, I'll use the website. I want to do this thing, use the mobile app. I want to do this thing, chat or voice. They're going to expect your brand to be on all those channels. So what is Stack Chat? At a fundamental level, we connect your business with your customers via voice or chat. We allow you to do this at scale using AI to automatically respond to consumer queries. We're a platform as a service business, which means you can use our product to build, run, and manage chat and voice applications without any of the complexity of doing it yourself. Your business doesn't look like this, right? Your business looks more like this. You've got internal APIs, you've got business insight tools, you've got CRM, analytics, you've got a marketing cloud investment. Our platform has native integrations into most major enterprise tools, and this means you just focus on building the best conversational experience possible. You don't have to worry about the integrations. And your users don't look like this either. Your users are distributed across many chat and voice channels, and they're using many different languages. Uh, Stack Chat's a truly omni-channel solution, so it allows you to design a conversational experience once and then deploy out to all the major chat channels, Facebook Messenger, WeChat, WhatsApp, and, we can, and you can do so in eight different languages, so English, Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, French, Italian, German, and Portuguese. So with this in mind, how do we fit into the travel companion solution that Dave told you about? Well, we are the layer of conversational AI that sits between the business functions and WeChat. And we are the enabling layer for Adobe Experience Cloud on WeChat. So how do we help the Chinese traveler to have a better, more human experience when traveling in Australia? Well, it comes back to these solution challenges that Dave mentioned. And the first one off the bat is creating an engaging chat experience using AI. The question we have to ask, is conversation the right fit? Now, we think it is. But let's not mince words, poor chatbot experiences in the past led some people to become disillusioned with chat. But now that disillusionment is over and we're on the other side of this backlash, and this is because better tools are being released, the AI is improving, and conversation design as a field is maturing. And leaders are understanding that AI-driven conversations is a really powerful approach to achieve their goal of the personalized one-on-one -on -one interaction at scale. But chatbots aren't necessarily a good fit for every customer interaction, so let's look at the value of chatbots to better understand how they should fit into your organization. So why are chatbots great? Three reasons, speed, simplicity, ubiquity. And let's start with speed. Language is native to everyone. There's no education involved. Everyone's an instant expert. You can say something to Alexa or Google Home or your phone much faster than you can open any app and you can type a question into chat faster than you can load a FAQ page of your website and scroll for days to try to find the right answer. Simplicity. The promise of chat and voice is say what you want, get what you want. In conversation, the user doesn't make errors. The channel is that simple. And this is where the latest natural language processing AI can really bring that powerful humanizing element to your brand. Because if you invest in understanding what it is your customers are, are saying to you at scale, and if you invest in understanding the sentiment of their language at scale, then you're truly listening to your consumers. 
Finally, ubiquity. So a recent forecast estimates that smart speaker install base will reach 100 million people this year. And of course, everyone in this room has a few chat apps installed. You've probably got Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, maybe WeChat. So the sheer number of entry points is staggering, and there are new opportunities arising all the time. And when pure language doesn't suit a given interaction, conversational UX components can be used right inside the chat app to recreate traditional UI experiences. So the idea here is a consumer can kick off an inter interaction with chat. For example, they might say, I would like to book a room in Sydney. The AI kicks in. It then understands the intent of the user, can extract keywords, and then send the user through to a conversation flow. Then the conversational UX kicks in, the UI shows up, date selection appears, you pick the date, the room type UX appears, so you can pick the type of room, and then it books you in with a confirmation. And this is how most of your chat interactions are going to work. It's going to be this seamless switching back and forth between the AI, the natural language processing, and into the conversational design funnels. It's your consumer's thoughts becoming reality with zero friction. So a few examples of the travel assistant. This would, of course, be in Mandarin. Uh, translate this word, I don't know. Will it rain today? I have four hours spare tomorrow. What should I do? What's the top-rated outdoor activity in Sydney? What's the nearest train station to me? So these are perfect use cases for chat because the user wants an immediate answer to an important question. It's a powerful way to reduce friction for the Chinese traveler. What about restaurant use cases? So popular seafood restaurants nearby. What's the top-reviewed restaurant in the CBD? Book me a table for two at Tetsuya's tomorrow night at 8. You might have trouble with that one, getting in at such short notice. Try booking me a table in a couple months or next year. You get the idea. So this is how we're going to create a great chat experience for the Chinese travelers. One, we're surfing, surfacing features that are suited to conversation. Two, we're taking advantages of the strength of the medium. Three, we'll be powered by feature-rich integrations. And four, we're easier than the alternatives. And that last one's really important for chat and voice. You have to be easier than the alternatives. That's the whole point of the medium, is reducing friction. And how do you create these experiences? Well, it's got to be easy. Conversation design, it needs to be a function of the business, not IT. You need tools that empower your content producers, your marketers, your brand team to creatively collaborate and create customer experiences in the same way they do for your web and mobile channels. Otherwise, your dev team needs to build the chatbot from scratch. They have to skill up. It's going to cost a fortune. The business gets cut out of the experience. Uh, and then you need to maintain the thing going forward. If you want to see how easy it is, um, stop by our exhibit. and happy to line up a demo for you. So that's the first problem solved. So the next one is, how do we handle the edge cases that AI isn't trained for? The answer is, you need a human. And we call this human takeover. And the way human takeover works is pretty simple. When the AI agent doesn't understand a given query, it gives the user the option to speak with a human. So remember, the chatbot's not pretending to be a human here. right? The person, the consumer, is fully aware that they're speaking to an AI agent. The agent then hands over to a human. And then the human can sort them out using whatever your business's existing customer support tools might be. It could be Zendesk, Lithium, whatever. They sort the consumer out. And then the AI agent takes control again. Simple enough, right? But your takeover strategy needs to be a bit more sophisticated than that. Data is the fuel for machine learning models. And a neural network, which is a type of machine learning model, needs a lot of data. And it gets smarter the more training data you can give it. But it's not feasible to be endlessly feeding your AI models training data. A real enterprise chatbot platform can't just provide an effort in intelligence out solution, because that effort in just can't scale. It's too expensive, takes too much time. So the way your AI will automatically get smarter with time is if you're feeding those support transcripts back into the AI models as training data. So with this approach, your chatbot will automatically adapt to more and more nuanced language over time, and you'll more hit, quickly hit those ROI targets you need. So that covers how we're handling the edge cases that the AI can't handle. On to the next challenge, the travel companion package we're building for the uh, travel industry. 
has Adobe Analytics included, but many companies are already actively using other Adobe Experience Cloud products like Experience Manager, Audience Manager. Um, we want to be able to leverage the Adobe Experience Cloud in the Travel Companion app. So Stack Chat has native integrations with most Adobe Experience Cloud products. So we can go down the list here. Number one, Audience Manager. So we can build audience profiles in conversational experiences with Audience Manager. Example here is I ask the travel companion about luxury hotels. Then I get retargeted with five-star hotel ads when I'm browsing WeChat moments later that day. Second one, Adobe Target. So we can use that to make voice and chat more personal. Example here, the chatbot can display targeted recommendations in WeChat based on past behavior. Adobe Experience Manager. So this integration means that you can create a unified customer journey across voice, chat, mobile, and web. So your digital asset management can remain the single source of truth for your company, for all your digital assets. And your content team can create channel-neutral content in AEM and content fragments, and then generate renditions for chat, renditions for voice, renditions for web, and renditions for mobile. Campaign. So right now, campaign is great at sending email blasts. With the Stack Chat integration, you can now do a blast to your email customers and another blast out to customers on chat, whether that be Facebook Messenger, WeChat, WhatsApp. And analytics, finally, you can gather voice and chat intelligence. Example here is just behavioral data being sent through, but also you can set up triggers on your website, which then might uh, have a push notification sent to the user. So you might get frustrated, visit the FAQ page five times in a row, your phone vibrates, the brand says, Seems like you're frustrated. Why don't you just tell us what your question is? We can see if we can help. And finally, you can use Adobe Launch to configure and deploy the Stack Chat Web Messenger to your website with just a few clicks. No need to get IT involved. Super straightforward. OK, so that covers off the Experience Cloud integration. Final challenge, how do we handle the increasingly complex security requirements like GDPR? Well, what does an enterprise chatbot solution look like? Your customer data obviously needs to be encrypted at both rest and in transit. You want everything wrapped up in a privacy program based on Australian, European, and US data laws. So you can be compliant with any privacy framework, including GDPR. And you want a deployment process that's no different to your existing enterprise tools. So your content producers come into your authoring environment, build out the chat experience. The QA team, they can then test that experience in a preview environment before it's finally approved and goes live into a production environment. So in short, it should be no different to your other tools. So that's the final challenge solved. And the reality is, companies that use messaging achieve a 2.9x greater annual increase in their net promoter score and a 25% greater annual growth in revenue than those who don't. Now, we're not claiming causation here, right? But there's a strong correlation between brands who are forward-looking, who are thinking strongly about what is my global conversational strategy? What are the chat channels that make sense for me? What are the voice channels that make sense for me? And the Travel Companion is an exciting project under active de development, and we look forward to sharing with you more later this year when it launches. Please check out our new white paper that we released this week, which is all about maximizing ROI on your chatbot implementations. You can download that from our website. And just before I go, please stop by and visit our, our exhibit on the showroom floor. We've got the giant Tesla Model X, you can't miss us. Um, we have a wine tasting voice experience on the Amazon Alexa. So come by, try a lovely drop of Grenache or Rosé. And that's it from me. Thanks so much for your time. Really enjoyed speaking with you.